All right, and welcome back to the show. Today we got a nine pound London broil for you today. We're gonna to show you how to season this up and cook it up. Stick around, don't go anywhere. So we're just gonna show you how to season this piece of meat. Now, this is London broil, like I said. Uh, a lot of people don't cook this piece of meat anymore. It was very big back in the late 70s, early 80s, and then it kind of died off from there. So this is a special cut, it's nine pounds and usually you see them a lot thinner. They're usually thinner and they usually are about the same length as this, but it's usually about, the cut usually starts about here. And it's usually about two inches thick. Uh, this right here is probably about five inches thick. So let's get the seasoning on this. Very, very basic. Kosher salt. This is a, you can look and see here. This is almost like pretzel, pretzel salt. It's a very coarse, uh, kosher salt and with this piece of meat we're only going to just use a little bit of this not gonna use a lot of it now in some other videos you see me with the chuck roast and you see me with the porterhouse I actually salted it overnight and just stuck it down in salt a piece of meat like this you can't do that to it's already uh, has a little bit of fat on it there's not that much fat in here, and you'll dry this piece of meat right out. It'll suck all the moisture out of it, and this piece of meat will turn into like a piece of shoe leather when you go to cook it. So I'm gonna do the sides, the top, and the bottom. And that's the bottom of it. Just to let you guys know also too, when you see pieces of meat like this. Now they dye a lot of the meats today. Um, when you see it turn brown like this, now back in the days, if you ever bought hamburger meat, you would see, if you open up the middle of it, it would be brown like this. And a lot of the butchers would take older hamburger meat because you know the red stuff sells, and they would pack the brown meat inside of the red meat. So the red part would be outside, and the brown part will be inside. And it was a way that butchers kept their meat selling. And today, you have to be very careful because when you buy some meats today, they'll die. So you want to make sure that you're not buying diet meats. And when you actually see it like that, brown, after it sits on one side, the oxygen doesn't get to it, and then the the blood goes away from it, it turns brown. If you still see that old red, there's a problem. That means it's dyed. All right, so we're gonna come in with some onion powder. Onion powder always does great. On smokers, cookers, and sometimes when you get garlic powder on stuff and you put it onto fires or you put it onto cookers, it kind of changes the meat. So a lot of people ask me, and a lot of you guys in the comments ask me, how come you never use any garlic powder? And that's why. So onion powder. You can give a liberal amount of this. And there you have it. So that pretzel salt will just, I'm gonna use this piece of meat to clean the pan so we don't waste any of our seasonings. And that pretzel salt will sit down in there. And we're gonna leave this out for a couple hours to get it up to room temperature. Now, what we're doing today with this piece of meat, we're doing a call the reverse sear. And when we get out onto the grill, I'll get more into that. But a reverse sear is where you're basically smoking it to get that smoke into it first, and then you're gonna cook it at the end. So that's what we're looking to do, a reverse sear on here, and that's it. So we'll show you how to cook up this nice piece of meat and keep it nice and moist and it won't dry out on you. And this is why a lot of people don't cook London broils because they dry them out. Your grandparents back in the days would put this under the broiler. Most people don't even know what a broiler is today, but it was a part under the stove, all the way down to the bottom, that had a flame directly over top of the meat. And they would put the meat under there and broil the top and then flip the meat over and broil the bottom. And most of your London broils were broiled. Hence the term London broil. There you go. All right, that's it. This is ready. Two hours, let it sit out. Onto the cooker it goes. Stick around, don't go anywhere. 
right, this is what we're rolling on today. This is the Golden's Cast Iron Kamado Cooker. With no further ado, let's show you around. All right, so this is the Golden's Cast Iron Cooker. Complete cast iron. This puppy weighs about 400 pounds. Let's show you the inside. Very, very heavy cooker. All cast iron grates. I mean, this thing is a beast. Works the same way as any other Kamado. It's just cast iron. Now, give me a second here, and I'm going to show you the great lifter. Now, it comes with tools like this. This is a great lifter. I could take this grate off of here and just put it off to the side like this. And here's the bottom of my cooker. Let's get some light in here. And this thing is built like a tank. And look at those hinges on the back. It's spring assisted. And even with the spring assist on it, it's still heavy. And you'll never go wrong with a cooker like this because this will outlast most people. I mean, just look at the tires on here. <laughs> the wheels, rather. They're even steel. I mean, I had this in my driveway at one point and it started going downhill. And when it started going downhill, I couldn't stop it. So that's that. And that's what we're going to be rolling with today. Let's close this back up. And let's just show you the back of this. Made right here in Georgia. Good old USA. And uh, she's a great cooker. Holds temperatures beautifully. It's got a nice gauge on the front that you could see. And this cooker is for a Kamado cooker. I mean, you don't need any gadgets to this thing or anything else, else like that. Uh, it'll hold temperatures beautifully and just stay right where you put it. So that's what we're firing up today. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. Okay, so let's show you my wood setup here now in this Kamado. So what I have here is I have my charcoal set up on the bottom. It is in the Weber charcoal basket. I use that uh, little charcoal basket off of uh, the Weber's and I take it out of my other Weber and I use it for this one. So I got some burned down charcoal on the bottom here. I always like my burned down charcoal because it offers that flavor, all the drippings are in there. And then I follow by a piece of wood on top just like that and then I light it. So that's my setup. Let's get some light in here so you can see what's going on. And that's that. So with no further ado, let's get this lit. And we'll meet you back out here. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, so our fire's lit. Now, this is where we're going to be placing the meat right here. And this is the indirect method. So our fires are on this side, our meat's on this side, and we're going to smoke just really, really, really low. So we're going to be rolling somewhere around 220 degrees till this meat reaches an internal temperature of probably somewhere around 115 degrees maybe a little bit less 113 and we don't want to cook this meat we just want to smoke it and add and infuse all that nice flavor to it and then we're going to cook it afterwards so this whole setup that you see here is going to come apart we're going to take all this out of here we're going to put our coals on the bottom of the smoker and then we're going to put a pot down in here and we're going to finish that meat off. We're going to sear it off in a, a nice cast iron cooking pot that I could just put right down in there. And that's how we're going to finish that off. That's about it. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, so we're running about 225 and it's time to put this meat on. Let's get it on. Now I put a probe in here because I want to watch my temperature. And I highly suggest that you guys do the same if you do this. You want to make sure that your temperature probe is in the middle of your meat. Not at the ends because you're getting a reading off the end of the meat. You want to put it in the thickest part of the meat. I have this probe right here. And then it's going to go down to this box I have on the bottom. Down here. Let me just hook this up for you guys. 
All right, and that's my box that I have here. Take these gloves off. And that's my box that I have. And then I have another one inside that's gonna give me my reading so I don't have to go out to my grill to see the temperature of the meat. And that's which, how you wanna set this up. It's crucial that you do this because we're gonna pull this right around 115. So let's get this closed, stabilized. And we'll see you back here. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, so we're about an hour and a half, maybe hour and 45 minutes in. We're just gonna show you what we have going on. So that's my meat probe. We're at 93 on the internal temperature of the meat. And on the gauge itself, we're rolling somewhere around 220. So we're about 220 on the gauge itself. And let's go show you the food. We're gonna open this up quickly and we're gonna get it closed quickly. And here we go. That's how the wood's doing. Don't really see a flame in there at all. And here's our meat cooking. So that's the setup. That's the way you wanna see it. You don't wanna see that thing flaming up. If I leave this open for longer, it will flame up and then I gotta stabilize it down again. But that's our cook. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, so she's on the cooker right now. She's rolling about 220 right now as we're watching the Richter scale. Steady as she goes. So what we're gonna do from here, this is gonna go probably until it gets up to internal temperature of 115 degrees. Right now it says 60 on our meat probe right now, so we're going nice and easy. When we bring it up to about 115 degrees, we're gonna pull it. We're gonna load this guy right up here and this is a cast iron Dutch oven and we're going to load this guy up right here and the reason why we're using a Dutch oven is because you don't want to start fumbling pans and hot coals so what we're going to do is we're going to spread those coals out pull the meat spread the coals out and then I'm going to put this pan right here down into those hot coals and we're going to put some lard in the bottom of that pan and we're going to char it up we're going to get it nice and browned up and we're going to sear it and that's why we call it a reverse sear so the first portion of this cook so we're getting all that nice flavor in. All that nice flavor is being pounded into the meat. Um, I hit it with a little bit more heavy smoke. You can see it now smoking uh, about 220. It's very crucial because you don't want this piece of meat to get past a certain stage because the minute you start searing, you're gonna go over that. This piece of meat's gonna go right up to about 145, 150 degrees and now we're making shoe leather. So you don't wanna do that. So that's our game plan and uh, you're gonna enjoy it. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, so our roast is at 114 degrees. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna pull it. I'm gonna leave the probe in. And there's a reason why I'm leaving the probe in. And then I'm gonna pull all of this stuff off and I'm gonna get this set up for the cooking method that we want. So all, everything's gonna come out of here. I'm gonna reload this with coals. Stick around, don't go anywhere. This is my coal setup. So what I did was I emptied out the little coal basket that was on the side. I'm gonna zoom in here and get a shot of this. And I just put some coals down the bottom. I open up all my vents down the bottom. I want these coals to be nice and hot. And I want them even. And what we'll do is we'll put that pot in there. We'll put a little bit of the lard on the bottom. We'll let it heat up, we'll put our roast in, and we'll brown it off. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, here we go. We'll get our pot in there. Just like that. Now we're gonna get our lard in here. Spread around. Just like that. Now because this is lard, it's got a nice smoke point on it. Alright, so we're heating this up. Now, 
I got my heat resistant gloves on here. Now, if you see, the lard is at one point, so we want to get it even. We want a nice, even consistency here. And that's that. Now let's get this pot heated up. And you can see it starting to bubble a little bit in there. And then in with the meat we go, we're going to start to brown it up. And while this is heating up, stick around. Don't go anywhere. And here we go. Let's go put her back in. All right, we're going to brown this off. Now, I'm leaving the probe in this as I brown it because I'm going to be able to check my temperature as I'm browning this. I want to be able to check where I'm at with this. So right now this roast is reading 122. And we're going to try to brown off all the sides without that temperature going up quickly. So we're still cooking it because it's a little bit too rare for myself. Just a second here. So I can brown up all the sides. That's the top. Look at that. Let's get the sides going. Just leave it there for a couple of seconds and we're just charring up all the sides. I lost my little thermometer. I gotta plug them back in. A little gauge. And as I'm charring up all the sides here, getting that nice crust on it, we're looking at our temperature gauge too. We want to show our temperature gauge because, like I said, I wanted to pull this at 125. So I can brown this all the way up until that gauge actually says 125 on it. Because if you hit past that, you're going over. Let's roll over. Look at that. That's what you're looking for right there. Now as I roll over on that side, get it in there into that nice lard. Just like that. I'm still checking my gauge to see where I'm at. I'm still at 122, so I'm safe. So that means I can brown this thing up pretty good because my temperature's not going up crazy. I got some time to work with this. Let's see that side. There we go. Now I'm going to start to char up the sides that I think could be a little bit more charred, like the bottom. There we go. Now at this point, what we're going to do is I'm going to put the rack back in. And I'm going to put that whole rack right on top of there.
until our roast reaches the temperature that we want. Nice part about working with these nice cast iron pans is that you can remove them just like this and put it right onto the floor. Just like that in the bucket while you put the grates back in. Now here's my grates back in. This thing is no longer cooking at the temperature that I wanted to cook at. So I'm going to put it back on to the eye like that. And then I'm going to put my temperature gauge back in. Just like that. And where am I? I'm at 124. Perfect. So I could still brown them up a little bit more. And then I'll take it off and let it rest. And there you have it. This roast is actually ready to pull. So I'm gonna leave the probe in because if I pull the probe out, I'm actually gonna let some of that juice get out of there. I'm just gonna brown that little spot up on the end so I'm gonna hold it just on that little spot. Not too pleased with that little spot on the end but everything else is looking pretty perfect. Okay, that little part there, and that little part there, and she's looking pretty good. So I'm pulling this at 125 basically, and it's gonna go up probably about five degrees on its own. There you have it, and she's looking pretty good. All right, so I'm gonna pull this right now. I'm gonna bring this inside, and then we're gonna show you how to make a nice sauce for this right here in this pot. Stick around, don't go anywhere. All right, so now we're gonna show you how to make a nice sauce for this. We have our pan here, we got all those nice drippings in here. We got some thyme, and to the pot she goes. Rosemary and shallot. Now, I do have some butter over here. We're gonna put the butter in last because I don't want to burn that butter. So let's get that in there, like that. We're gonna let that cook up a little bit. Now I could take these grates back off and drop it directly down into the fire if I want that to be hotter. But I think we're just gonna chill out, mellow out right now. We're gonna put the, the butter in in just a little bit. And we'll just let all those flavors just kind of marinate in there. All right, here we go, here's our butter. I'm gonna go in with two sticks and slowly cook it. Now this is frozen butter. I like using frozen butter so it doesn't melt down way too fast. And when it melts down fast, it'll burn. So let's just move that around. Get that nice sauce made for this. Now, if I was losing some heat, I could always close this lid, but I think I'm just going to leave the lid open right now, and I want a nice, gentle sauce. All 
those drippings from the meat are in there. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is lard and butter in there. This will make you want to bite your finger off. This nice sauce. And like I said, you don't want to really burn the butter. You just want all those nice herbs to get that in there like that. All right, we're gonna let this simmer down. And what I'll actually do is what I have here to give it a little flavor is a little red drinking wine, table wine. And that's all you need. We're gonna let this simmer down. When that steak is ready, this will go over top of it and this will be a beautiful thing. So stick around, don't go anywhere. Our sauce is almost ready. A couple of more seconds and I'm gonna pull it. But that was our sauce here. I just wanna let this get a little bit more thicker and all those nice herbs and flavors in there. And that's what we're gonna to use to drizzle right over our meat. That nice little sauce with these nice herbs in here. And that's it. I'm gonna pull this in just a little bit. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're done. We're on the chopping block. Let's see what we got. Look at that. First thing I'm gonna do, I put no pepper on here. Let's get a little pepper on here. This is a uh, 16 mesh black pepper. I'm gonna put a little bit on there. All right. And let's get it over onto the, the chopping board. Now that nice juice that's in there, what you guys can do is that you guys can take this nice juice that's here and we're gonna put it in with our nice sauce that we made. We'll give that a whisk. We can always heat that up, put it back on the stove. And now let's get to slicing. First thing I'm going to do is hit this on an angle and go right in the middle just to show you what we got. Now this rested better half of 20 minutes and here we go. Look at that. Now that pulled at about 130. That's London broil right there. All right, we're going to show you a couple of in pieces. I'm going to put this in back. I'm going to show you a couple of end pieces from the rear of this. We're going to get the slicing. Here, look at that. Perfect. When you're doing London broils like this, you want to slice them thin. They're not the Feli Biyang of cuts but they're really tender and good if you get a good slice on it. So that's the, the end of it. And now we're gonna get a couple of slices from the other end. All right, so this is the big end of it. On an angle, slice down. Just like that. And that's a nice piece. We're gonna do it again for you guys. Nice thing about London broils I own a professional slicer, and I could slice sandwiches for this, steak sandwiches for lunch, but look at that. You are not gonna go wrong with that. That is a beautiful piece. Let's cut that in half. And go for a nice taste. Right here. Excellent. I'm going to take a piece from the end and show you that. It just pulls apart. Put in some of that nice sauce.
dynamite. Well, let's plate this up, and we'll see you right back here. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. All right, there it is, and there you have it, a classic London broil. And if you like this video and more that are about to come, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit that little notification so you get all the videos first. And with no further ado, I gotta get that Pitmaster's taste.